بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Today's topic is pertaining to the mannerisms that a Muslim should have with his Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And as you can imagine, anything pertaining to Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is going to be of great importance. And the first mannerism that the believer has to have is he has to have ta'zim of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi When we say this word ta'zim, we mean that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is regarded high in the heart and the mind of the believer, in the soul of the believer. The believer looks upon Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam as somebody being full of virtue, above majestic, the best of creation, the most loved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, the dearest being that there can ever be in our hearts. That's why we raise him in high status in our minds, our souls, and our hearts. This is the meaning of ta'zim. And of course, it has many applications in our lives. What is this meaning of ta'zim? But first and foremost, I want you to think about why did I start with this as being the first mannerism? Because we know that there's so many other mannerisms that we have with regards to the Prophet ﷺ. But why did I start with this as being the first mannerism? Because from this, the other features will stem. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-A'raf, فَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بِهِ وَعَزَّرُوهُ So those who believed in Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, وَعَزَّرُوهُ Meaning they gave him ta'zim. They gave him high status in their hearts and in their minds and souls. From this came what? وَنَصَرُوهُ They gave him victory. Because why? Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the most important thing to them, the companions radiyallahu anhu. So after that was established faith and the ta'zim of the Prophet ﷺ was established, giving victory to the Prophet ﷺ was something only natural. They would sacrifice everything they owned in the path of victory for Allah and the Prophet ﷺ. So they gave him victory, they followed him, and they followed the revelation that was sent down to the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. And Allah says, They are the ones who are successful in terms of being true believers. So it comes from having Iman in the Prophet ﷺ and comes from having Ta'zim of the Prophet ﷺ. In Bukhari, it's narrated by Urwa ibn Mas'ud, or is narrated that Urwa ibn Mas'ud, he entered upon the Prophet ﷺ in Sulh al hudaybiyah in the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. And as he was negotiating with the Prophet ﷺ the terms of that treaty and discussing with the Prophet ﷺ, he was looking around at the companions radiallahu anhum, anhum and observing them, how they were behaving with the Prophet ﷺ. Afterwards, he went back to his people, the disbelieving Quraysh, and he said, Oh my people, I have come to you from Muhammad ﷺ, and I let you know that I have been to many palaces and many kingdoms. And I have seen how those people treat their kings, the Caesar of the time, the Najasi of the time. I've been to all of them, he said, and I've seen how the courtiers of their courts treat them. But I want you to know that it's nothing in comparison to how the companions of Muhammad ﷺ treat Muhammad. Muhammad ﷺ, he said that if something was to emanate from his body, in terms of nuqama, in terms of something from the nose or the mouth, saliva, the companions, they would rush to the Prophet ﷺ and they would grab that. And what they would do with that? They would wipe it upon their bodies for barakah. And he said, whenever the Prophet ﷺ commanded them with something, they would rush like the wind as quick as they could to fulfill that command of the Prophet ﷺ. And he said, whenever the Prophet ﷺ would make wudu, they would push one another to try to get under the Prophet ﷺ to collect that water because it would be full of barakah coming from the Prophet ﷺ. And he said that when they spoke to the Prophet ﷺ, they spoke softly because they revered him so much. They could hardly look at the Prophet ﷺ in his face because of that deem that they had. So this is what this kafir at the time, he noticed in the behavior of the companions to the Prophet ﷺ. And this is how the believers have to be. The believers have to hold Muhammad ﷺ in such high regard in such high esteem. And from that, as the brother mentioned, the other things will fall into place. Another characteristic, mannerism, which is extremely important for us to have with the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is al-muhabba wal-ittiba. 
is to follow the Prophet Sallallahu and to have love in following the Prophet Sallallahu It's not just following, you follow with love. So if you were to ask any Muslim, do you love the Prophet Sallallahu What are they going to say to you? They're going to say yes. Even if the person, he has bad sins, major sins. Maybe he's drinking alcohol, may Allah protect us and the Muslims. Maybe he's doing some other kind of riba or something. Huge sins. But if you were to ask him the question, do you love the Prophet Sallallahu for sure, he and she will say, yes, I do. But is this what is understood by love? Is it just an emotion? Is it just a statement? Or is it something more than that? Of course, it's more than that in the understanding of Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Qalat al-A'rabu amanna. The, the Arab Bedouins, they said to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that verily we have believed. So Allah revealed, Qulu lam tu'minu. Rather say that you haven't believed, you haven't believed, meaning Iman hasn't properly settled in your heart. But say that you have submitted outwardly, outwardly in Islam. Okay? However, However, if you obey Allah and His Prophet, then nothing from your deeds will go to waste. So this is the key here in the ayah. That it's about obeying Allah and obeying the Rasul. It's not enough to say I've become a Muslim. It's not enough to say that I love the Prophet ﷺ. In the other verse, Allah mentions in Surah Al Imran, "Qul in kuntum Allah, yuhbibkum Allah wa lakum dunubakum. Say if it is true that you claim that you truly love Allah and that you truly love Muhammad ﷺ, then follow me. That is the reality of true love. Then Allah will forgive you your sins. Okay? Allah will love you back and forgive you your sins. So the point I'm trying to get to, that is all of us, we claim that we love the Prophet Wasallam, But it's not enough. The claim is not enough. It has to come with action. It has to come with following of the sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam. It has to come with striving to be on the way that Muhammad Wasallam left. If our desires are conflicted with the commands of the Prophet Wasallam, often, then we should realize that there is a weakness in our iman. If we find it difficult to follow the statement of the Prophet Sallallahu the commands of the Prophet Sallallahu the prohibitions, then we need to check ourselves. Why is it that it's so difficult? It's because it's a lack of iman and knowledge or both. In Bukhari and Muslim, Anas radiallahu anhu said that the Prophet Sallallahu said, لا يؤمن أحدكم None of you will believe. When you come across a hadith like this, none of you will believe. It doesn't automatically mean a negation of faith, as some have misunderstood it. So don't go around negating faith from people, okay? It doesn't automatically mean that. What it means is that the completeness of faith is not there. Your faith is not how it should be. لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى أكون أحب إليه من والده ووالده والناس أجمعين The Prophet ﷺ said, None of you will have true faith, complete faith, until I, the Prophet Sallallahu become more beloved to you than his father, his children, and all of mankind. What does this mean in reality? It's nice to hear, and it stokes our emotions, but what is the reality of that? An example, your kids who are beloved to you, they are asking you, Baba, we want to watch such and such movie. We want to go with our friends and watch such and such movie. So your kids are so loved to you, and you know that that movie has haram in it. But you can't say no to your kids because they're going to cry and they're going to be hurt. All of their friends are going, their cousins are going, right? It's going to be hard for you to say no to them. Here's the problem. You have to apply that the Prophet ﷺ is dearer to you and his commands are dearer to you than everything else. So if there's ever a conflict between the things that you love and they are leading you to disobedience of Allah and his Rasul, then you turn away from that and you obey Allah and his Rasul. Okay, you have to establish the law of Allah and His Rasul. In Sahih Muslim, it's narrated by Abdullah ibn Abbasin radiallahu anhu that the Prophet وسلم, he once saw one of the companions and the companion was wearing a gold ring. And we know that gold is impermissible for the men of this ummah. So the Prophet وسلم, having concern for his companions, he loved his companions, there's no way he would let that go. Because he knows that if the companion continues to wear that ring, he's liable to be punished by Allah Azawajal. So from his concern and his compassion, he went up to the companion and he took the ring from the Sahabi and he threw it to show his disdain for this disobedience to Allah. That wearing gold is disobedience to Allah for men. 
After the Prophet ﷺ walked away, the other companions, they said to this one whose ring was thrown, خُذْ قَاطِمِكْ وَانْتَفِعْ بِهِ Take your ring and benefit from it. Right? What did the companion say? He said, لا والله لا أخذه وقد طرحه رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم I would never take it after the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم has thrown it away. Now remember, this is a Bedouin living in the desert. He has nothing. That gold ring to him was a fortune. Yet, when the Prophet ﷺ showed him that it was disobedience to Allah Azawajal, he couldn't turn back to it. So how about us today? The people who take out riba loans with so many excuses thinking that they need that. The people who do bribery and corruption thinking they need that to get their wealth. Turn away from what is displeasing to Allah and His Rasul and be happy about that like this companion was. That he never wanted to go back to that ring after the Prophet ﷺ had thrown it away. When we follow the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ because we love him and we understand that this is the best of guidance, we should follow the Prophet ﷺ's sunnah proudly and happily. We know that the society that we are living in today will ridicule you. Brother, why, what's your bed so long? Take care of your bed, cut your bed. What's wrong with you wearing a thobe? Ray, lower your thobe a little bit. Why is it above your ankles? You look strange. So many things they try to make fun of us, the way we behave. Why don't you go to the nightclubs? Are you socially incompatible with society? You can't socialize? Issue after issue, they pick on the Muslims. But you, because you know that the Prophet ﷺ was the best of creation and the most perfect of creation, and loved by Allah Azawajal, and what he came with was pristine guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you are proud to follow the Prophet sallallahu right? And today, we have people who they are shy. But we remind them the Prophet sallallahu said in Sahih Muslim, Bada al-Islam al-Gharib, wa sayaudu kama bada gharibaan fatuba lil ghuraba. That Islam began as something strange. It began as something strange. And it will once again become something strange like it began. But give tuba to those who are strangers. Tuba is a tree in Jannah. Give glad tidings of Jannah to those who are strange. So if you find yourself strange and people are ridiculing you, remember this hadith that the Prophet وسلم, is giving you a glad tiding. Don't be afraid to stand out from the rest, from the majority of people. People are not afraid today. A man wears women's clothes. A woman, a woman wears men's clothing. People have the strangers with haircuts. They look like roosters. People are gender mixing, yet they're not shy of that. So why should we be shy of following the Prophet Sallallahu pristine guidance? Always raise your head high and be proud of what you are doing. Salman al-Farsi radiallahu anhu as in Sahih Muslim, the Quraysh of the time, the polytheists, the kuffar, they came to him to ridicule him, to make fun of him. But what did he do? They chose the wrong man. They chose the wrong man to try to make fun of. They came to him, they tried to make him feel small for following the Prophet Sallallahu they said, your Prophet, يُعَلِّمُكَ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ حَتَّى الْخِرَاءَ The Prophet ﷺ teaches you everything, حَتَّى الْخِرَاءَ Even how to go to the bathroom and relieve yourself. They were trying to make fun of him. What did Salman do? He said, Ajal, yeah, of course. The Prophet ﷺ taught me, أَلَّا نَسْتَقْبِلَ الْقِبْلَ بِالْغَائِتِ وَلَا بَوْلِ That I shouldn't face the Qibla when I go to relieve myself, whether it's number one or number two. وَلَا نَسْتَنْجِيَ بِالْيَمِينَ And I shouldn't use my right hand. And I shouldn't use less than three stones. Nor should I use dung, animal dung, nor should I use bones. So here you see, he gave a full, complete answer, full of so much confidence. And this is how the believer is supposed to be. When the people come to you, they try to prod you, and they try to ridicule you about your following of the Prophet ﷺ, turn the tables. Use it as a chance for giving da'wah to them. Show them how happily proud you are of following Allah and His Rasul. Not by being arrogant. You're not trying to be arrogant, but you are proud because you're full of confidence that this is revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So as they say, say it loud and wear it proud. Wear what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you in terms of guidance. And a point to remember is as some have mentioned that much of what we fear in terms of Practicing our deen is just paranoia in our minds. Really and truly, if you are an employee at work that has good skills and you have good ethics, regardless of what you're wearing or the beard that you grow, the people don't really care. What really matters is your interactions with people. Are you an honest person? 
Are you a trustworthy person? Do you know how to do your job properly? Are you a good student at university? Are you a good employee? These things count. So these fears that we create in our mind, this paranoia that, oh my God, you know, are they going to make fun of me for my beard? My trousers are slightly above my ankles. Will they make fun of me? Will they make fun of me for praying? No, they won't. They will learn to accept you because you are the best example that they can be of a human being because you are following the best of human beings, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Also, from the important etiquette with regards to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is tark al taqaddam bayna yadayhi, is that none should put themselves before the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in his presence or not in his presence. What does this mean? Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala in Madarij al-Salikin, Imam Ibn Qayyim, he said, ومن الأدب مع رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ألا يتقدم بين يديه بأمر ولا نحي ولا إذن ولا تصرف that the person who is in front of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم or يعني living in his time that he never puts himself forward to be able to give a command pertaining to the religion nor to be able able to give a prohibition pertaining to the religion nor to be able to tell people you should do this or you should do that unless this comes from the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم so you don't put yourself before the Prophet ﷺ. You have to wait expressly for his command, for his guidance. What is he telling us to do? How is he telling us to behave in this particular situation? Is he telling me to go left? Is he telling me to go right? What is the command from the Prophet ﷺ? Ya amanu la tuqaddimu bayna yaday wa rasuli. The Prophet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Oh you who believe, don't put yourself before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger in terms of what I've just mentioned. Okay, but that was in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu We're not there. Does it still apply to us? It still applies to us. And this leads on as a segue to the next thing. Is that you shouldn't raise your voices in the presence of the Prophet Sallallahu The companions, they were commanded not to raise their voices in the presence of the Prophet Sallallahu because Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala said, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, la tarfa'u aswatakum fawqa sawtin nabi. O oh, you who believe, do not raise your voices above the voice of the Prophet ﷺ. Okay? So one of the companions, Thabit ibn Qais, when he heard this verse being revealed, he locked himself away from society and he became tearful and worried. And he said, woe to myself. It's known that I have the loudest voice from amongst the companions. So I have to keep myself away because the verse he thought was referring to him. Because when he would speak, his voice would drown out the voices around him. It would be louder than everyone else's voice. So the Prophet ﷺ asked about him, where is this companion? I haven't seen him for so many days. So Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh, who was his neighbor, he said, Ya Rasulullah, I will check on him. And he went to check on him. And he said, what is your situation? Why are you hiding from the Prophet ﷺ? He said, I heard the verse revealed that you shouldn't raise your voices in the company of the Prophet So I'm hiding myself away because I am from the people of disobedience, from the people of hellfire, because my voice is too much loud. So he went back, Sa'ad ibn Mu'ad, with this to the Prophet And the Prophet said, go and tell him that rather he is from the people of Jannah. He is not from the people of hellfire. So Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah ta'ala, he says, then what do you think? He says, فَمَا ذَنْ بِرَفِ الْعَرَى وَالْنَتَائِجِ الْأَفْكَارِ عَلَى سُنَّتِهِ وَمَا جَاءَ بِهِ He said, if this was the situation of the companions, that they were so scared after the revealing of the ayah, that they were scared about the raising of their voices in front of the Prophet ﷺ, then Ibn Qayyim is saying, how about those then who raised their own self-made opinions and decisions after discussions above that of the dis uh, decisions of the Prophet ﷺ? He said, this is worse. And this is the application for us in our day and age. That we should never put our opinions before the guidance of the Prophet We should never allow ourselves to be deluded into thinking my understanding, my opinion, my way of living is better than the guidance of the Prophet If the Prophet said go left, we have to go left. We cannot say go right. We have to be from those to follow exactly what the Prophet ﷺ is saying. And sadly, you have probably had encounters like I have had. You have people that come to you and they say crazy things like, you know, um, because there's different classifications of hadith, there's authentic hadith, there's weak hadith, we think we just shouldn't follow the hadith anymore. We think we should follow only the Quran. These crazy people deluded. 
1400 years the Muslims had unity in understanding that the hadith, that the sunnah is revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sunnah is guidance as the Quran is guidance. Yes, there are different classifications and the ulama of hadith have separated between them. But nobody should think that I can reject that hadith and I will follow only the Quran. And these foolish people, had they followed the hadith, they would have known that we shouldn't fall into this trap that shaitan has made for us. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ said in Tirmidhi, لا ألفينا أحدكم متكئا على أريكته يأتيه أمر من إندي مما أمرت به أو نحيت عنه يقول ما أدري ما وجدنا في كتاب الله تبعناه The Prophet ﷺ said, Let me never find one of you reclining upon his couch and an order comes to him from me from that which I command him to do or that which I tell him to stay away from and he says, I don't know meaning I'm not sure if this is from the Prophet ﷺ. What I find in the Qur'an, I will follow. Exactly what has come now, the, the misguidance, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned it 1400 years ago. So had these people who reject the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ and they follow their own desires and their own deluded interpretations, had they followed the sunnah and read into the sunnah, they would have saved themselves from this trap of shaitan. So the point is like Ibn Qayyim, he said, that do not raise your voices above the voice of the Prophet ﷺ means also in our time that our opinions are to be lowered and put under the feet of the Prophet ﷺ if they contradict with the Prophet ﷺ. Here, I just need to mention a side point which is quite important. Some people, they quickly fire the gun of misguidance. He's misguided, he's misguided, he's misguided. Bida, bida, bida. We shouldn't be loose with this terminology. It's true, it has to be said at certain times that people are misguided or this is an innovation. But just because somebody is differing with you on a matter or differing with your sheikh, it doesn't automatically mean that that sheikh or that person is not following the sunnah, no. Because the sunnah, the hadith itself, is not enough to follow. The hadith has to be checked, is it authentic? Then after its authenticity, it has to be checked, the siyaq of the hadith, the context of the hadith, does it apply to the situation we are discussing? If it does apply, what about the other hadith in this context? How do we join between the two hadith? If there's an apparent contradiction, which one was first and which one was second? And so many other matters apply to this. So automatically, just because somebody you feel is not doing the sunnah in the way that you are doing the sunnah, it doesn't automatically mean that the person is not following the sunnah. Because there is no scholar from the scholars of Islam who are well known, the Imams and the A'imma that we know, their famous names, Ibn Qudama, Ibn Taymiyyah, Imam Abu Hanifa, Shafi, uh, Izzah ibn Abdi Salam, all these great names and so many others. There's none of them except that they lived to establish the Sunnah. Yes, they had mistakes because they were human beings. Yes, they got it wrong at times because they were human beings. But their outlook was to establish the Sunnah. So never be that person who is quick to criticize people in that manner in this type of situation, right? Another very important uh, etiquette when it comes to following the Prophet Sallallahu and having manners towards the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi is where Allah says, لا تجعلوا الدعاء رسولي بينكم كدعاء بعضكم بعدا Do not make the calling of you with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as you call one another. So when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was addressed Nobody was allowed to say to him, Ya Muhammad. The believers couldn't call him Ya Muhammad. They had to say, Ya Rasulullah, Ya Nabiullah, like this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself in the Quran always addressed the Prophet sallallahu as Rasul, as Nabi, never addressed him as Muhammad. So this verse, which is saying that do not call the Prophet sallallahu as you would call one another, this is the first inter interpretation of it. That when the Prophet ﷺ is dressed, you do not say, Ya Muhammad. You say, Ya Rasulullah, Ya Nabiullah. But we're not living in the time of Muhammad ﷺ. We're not addressing him. So when we call upon, when we mention the name of Muhammad ﷺ, we are allowed to do it like this. We can say Muhammad ﷺ said X, Y, and Z. But it's better to say Nabiullah ﷺ said or Rasulullah ﷺ said. Okay? However, you're not committing haram if you do say Muhammad ﷺ said so. Now the second interpretation of this verse that I mentioned is, as the scholars say, لا تجعلوا دعاه لكم بمنزلة دعاء بعدكم بعدا إن شاء أجاب وإن شاء ترك بل إذا دعاكم لم يكن لكم بد من إجابته. 
The ulama, they say that this verse is saying that don't make the calling of the Prophet Sallallahu when you address him like how you address other people. It means that when it pertains to the commands and the speech that comes from the Prophet Sallallahu don't treat it as the speech of any ordinary human being thinking you have the right to not listen to it or you have the right to delay its implementation or to turn away from it. Nothing of that nature whatsoever. Whatever the Prophet Sallallahu said, you have to respond to it immediately. In Bukhari, Abi Sa'id ibn Mu'alla, he said, Kuntu asalli fil masjid. I was praying in the masjid. Fada'ani Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam called me whilst I was praying. Falam ujib. I didn't respond to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Fa'atay ilayh. Then I came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Wa qult, Ya Rasulullah, kuntu asalli. O Prophet of Allah, I was praying. So he's making an excuse for himself. The Prophet Sallallahu said, Alam tasma' qawlullah ta'ala istajibu lillahi wa rasulihi idha da'akum lima yuhyikum. Respond to Allah and His Messenger if they call you to that which is going to give you life, life of the soul in this world and the hereafter. Meaning that you have no excuse. There is no excuse for ever turning away from what the Prophet Sallallahu is saying. How many excuses do we make in our lives for turning away from the Prophet Sallallahu statement? This Sahabi, he was praying. He had an excuse, really and truly, but not in the sight of the Sharia. What about us? We turn away daily from the commands and the guidance of the Prophet. ﷺ. In Abi Dawood, Ibn Masudin radiallahu anhu, he was walking to the masjid. And it said that the Prophet ﷺ was on the member. And he said to the people, ageless. He was talking to someone inside the masjid, sit. Abdullah bin Masood was outside the masjid walking. He heard the voice of the Prophet ﷺ. He couldn't but help himself except that he sat in the place that he was. Like the voice of the Prophet ﷺ for them was a remote control. Their souls were so attached and trained upon obedience of the Prophet ﷺ. Just the sound of the Prophet ﷺ's voice giving a command was enough for them. Allahumma salli Muhammad wa ala al-Muhammad. Beautiful generation of people that we have to look into their lives. If we want to learn how to follow the Prophet ﷺ, what is the reality of Islam? We have to wear the glasses of the companions. We have to look through the lens of the behavior of the companions to understand what it truly means to be a believer. Uh, from the most important of the etiquettes pertaining to the Prophet ﷺ is to make salah upon Muhammad ﷺ. In Tirmidhi and Ahmad, it's narrated by Ali ibn Abi Talib that the Prophet said, Al Bakhilu al Ladi ida dukhirtu indu indahu lam yusalli alayhi. He said that the miser, the stingy person, is the one that when my name is mentioned in front of him, he doesn't say salah upon me. So when you hear Muhammad, وسلم, ensure that you say it. It doesn't have to be loud, but ensure that you say it. Ensure that your tongue is moving and ensure that you enjoy sending salah upon Muhammad. The Prophet said in Tirmidhi, Ma jalasa qawman majlisan lam yadhkuru fihi Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa lam yusallu ala nabiyyihim illa kana alayhim tiratan in sha'a adhabahum wa in sha'a ghafara lahum. The Prophet said, No people sit in a gathering whereupon they do not mention Allah Azza wa Jal or they don't and they don't send salah upon the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam except that for them on the day of judgment is going to be deep regret and loss. If Allah wishes, he will punish them. If he wishes, he will forgive them. So sending salah upon Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when his name is mentioned is something imperative. Something to encourage us now to send salah upon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In Sahih al targhib of Shaykh Al-Albani, Ta'ala, we have the narration of Ubay ibn Ka'b. With this companion, he said, Ya Rasulullah, inni ukthiru salah alayk, fa kam aj'al laka min salati. This companion, he said, Ya Rasulullah, I make lots of salah upon you. What did he mean when he said, I make lots of salah upon you? So salah comes with the meaning of the salah that we know, Allahu Akbar, right? It also comes with the meaning of dua, the linguistic meaning, dua. So here he's referring to dua. He's saying, Ya Rasulullah, we never have time to make dua. Instead of making dua for myself, I make lots of salah upon you. That time that I use for dua, I sit there and I say, Allahumma salam Muhammad wa ala al-Muhammad. So he said, how much of this should I do for you? The Prophet sallallahu being the humblest of creation, he said, ma shit. He said, whatever you wish to do, sir. Not commanding him to do anything. So the companion, he said, 
a rubah. Shall I do a quarter of that time for you? The Prophet ﷺ said, In shit fa in fa khayrun lak. If you wish, that's fine. But if you do more, it's better for you. So then he said, Nisf, shall I do a half year Rasulullah? The Prophet ﷺ said, In shit fa in zidta, walakin in zidta fa huwa khayrun lak. If you wish, do a half. But if you do more, it's better for you. Then the companion, he said, Thuluthayn, Ya Rasulullah, two thirds of my time. He said, In shit, fa in zidta fa huwa khayrun lak. If you wish, but if you do more than two thirds, then it's better for you. Then the companion said, Ya Rasulullah, aj'alu laka salati kulliha. O Prophet of Allah, shall I make all of my dua for you? All of that time that I'm making dua for you, Ya Rasulullah, the Prophet ﷺ said, إِذَا تُكْفَ هَمَّكْ وَيُغْفَرْ لَكَ ذَنْبَكْ If you do that, then all of your needs will be sufficed and all of your sins will be forgiven. Because Allah knows what you want. He knows why you are doing this, why you're sending so much salah upon Muhammad Wasallam. You're doing it because you want good in this dunya and the akhirah. And Allah will choose for you that which is good for you. So the more salah you send upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the easier your affairs will be in this dunya and in the akhirah. The more you send salah upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the better your mental health and spiritual health will be. And the better you will find ease in your worldly affairs. So race to make salah upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Just before we end, a few examples of this ta'zeem, love and reverence from the companions radiyallahu anhum. In Bukhari, it's mentioned that Urwa ibn Masood, when he came upon the gathering of the Prophet ﷺ, I believe this was in Hudaybiyah, the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, he was debating with the Prophet ﷺ and discussing the terms. So he's coming closer to the Prophet ﷺ and he's putting his face, he's putting his hand near the face of the Prophet ﷺ until he touches the beard of the Prophet ﷺ and he's a non-Muslim. Al-Mughira ibn Shu'ba, he said, when he saw that, he was standing behind the Prophet ﷺ with his sword. He said to this guy, اقبض يدك عن لحية رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قبل أن لا ترجع إليك. He said, take your hand from the Prophet ﷺ's bed before it doesn't come back to you. Meaning he was going to chop it off. This is the ta'zeem that they had for the Prophet ﷺ. Just somebody touching the bed of the Prophet ﷺ in the wrong way was enough to make them stand up and do something about it. Yet we live in a time where people are ridiculing the Prophet ﷺ left, right and center accusing him of all sorts of blasphemous things, yet we go to sleep with no problem. It doesn't affect our hearts. I'm not asking anyone to go and take your sword and harm them, no. That's for the authorities to do, to deal with them in that manner. But I'm saying, make the effort to spread Islam, teach Islam, teach the Sunnah, learn about the Sunnah so we can show the people that how beautiful Muhammad Wasallam was. When people say to you at work, man, you're such a nice guy. You say, yeah, because my Prophet Wasallam taught me to be like this. When you work all the time and you never cheat with regards to your timings, you're always there on time and you don't leave late. Yeah, because my Prophet ﷺ told me to be like this. Any opportunity you have to teach the people about Muhammad ﷺ, do it. This is our sword in our time. The teaching of the seerah and the blessed way of the Prophet ﷺ. In Sahih Muslim, Amr ibn As radiyallahu anhu, he said, Ma kana ahadun ahabba ilayya min Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, nobody was more beloved to me than the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa la ajal fi aynayya minhu. And nor was he more revered, nobody was as revered to me as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was. Wa ma kuntu atiqu an amla aynayya min ijlal, minhu ijlal lahu. However, though I loved him so much and I revered him so much, because of this I could never have a full glance at the Prophet ﷺ. Can you imagine? Meaning the Prophet ﷺ was so majestic in his eyes, he could never fully look at the Prophet ﷺ out of such reverence and love that he had for the Prophet ﷺ. So he said, if you were to ask me to give you a description of the Prophet ﷺ, I couldn't do it because I never fully looked at him. I never stared at him. This is something unbelievable, something amazing, and how they would love the Prophet ﷺ. Zayd ibn Dathinna, this companion was caught by the Quraysh. He was caught by the kuffar of the Quraysh. Before they were going to kill him, Abu Sufyan, before he became a Muslim, he asked his companion, he asked Zayd ibn Dathinna. Because he heard these stories about how the companions loved the Prophet Sallallahu So he wanted to know, let me test this guy. He knows he's about to be killed. So he said, oh Zayd, I implore you by Allah Azza wa Jal, tell me the truth. You're going to die, tell me the truth. Would you not now prefer that Muhammad Sallallahu is your, in your place, about to have his neck chopped? And you are with your family happy and sound? Zayd, he said, Wallahi la uhib an yakunu muhammadan al-an fi makanihi al-ladhi huwa fi. 
تصيبه شوكة تؤذيه وأني جالس بين أهلي. He says, I swear by Allah, I would not love that the Prophet وسلم, wherever he is now, in the place that he is, that a thorn would prick the Prophet وسلم, and hurt him, and I am there safe amongst my family. He's saying that my life, I am so happy to put it before the life of the Prophet وسلم. I should be harmed and the Prophet وسلم, should never be harmed. So Abu Sufyan, when he heard this, he just became astonished and he said some poetry. He said, مَا رَأَيْتُ مِنَ النَّاسِ أَحَدًا يحب أحدا كأصحاب محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم يحب محمد He said I have never seen anybody from amongst the people love anybody like the way the companions of Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم love Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم So these were just a few points pertaining to the mannerisms with the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم in terms of revering him holding him in high esteem okay and in terms of following the sunnah of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and not following our own opinions and learning to look at how the companions, radiyallahu anhum, they love the, the, the Prophet sallallahu That is the way to understand how to love the Prophet sallallahu is through looking at how the companions did it. They didn't take him to extremes. They didn't go to his grave and call upon him after his death. They didn't make dua to the Prophet sallallahu They learned only to make dua to Allah azza wa So if you want to learn the true love, it wasn't about celebrating the birthday of the Prophet sallallahu It was about following the Prophet sallallahu and his teachings. So there was so much more to say in this topic and I know that I didn't give the right and the due that it should have been given because when speaking about Allah or the Prophet ﷺ, you can never give the topic its due right. But I hope this is an introduction for us to go and research a bit more and to learn a bit more. I ask Allah to make this heavy in our scale of good deeds and to forgive me for any shortcomings and mistakes and to know that anything which was correct was from Allah. If you have any questions, then feel free. Beautiful question. Is there any way to know that the Prophet ﷺ loves you? You couldn't know that the Prophet ﷺ loves you because he's disconnected from this world. He's now in the barzakh life. However, there's two things here regarding to your question. The more you send salah upon Muhammad ﷺ, the more he will come to know you by your name. He will know you as a person, right? So in that sense, he will know you. Right? But I cannot say love because the hadith doesn't mention that. But he will know you because the angels, they will take your salah to him and say that this so-and-so, the son of so-and-so, sent salam to you. So this is something beautiful to do. Secondly, one of the ways of knowing if the Prophet ﷺ loves you is to know, does Allah love me? And how do I know if Allah loves me if I find myself in gatherings such as this? If I find myself attached to the Quran, if I find myself always choosing the pleasure of Allah Azawajal over any other pleasure in this world, then that is for sure a way of knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves me. Because I couldn't do any of those beautiful deeds except with Allah Azawajal loving me, subhanahu wa ta'ala.